Final Fantasy IV is one of the greatest games of all time, writes gaming critic and running gag on this series, Tim Rogers. I think I like it too much. This series is always going to follow the Japanese chronology of Final Fantasy, but it has to be impressed what Final Fantasy IV, aka Final Fantasy II US, means to the North American audience. While it, alongside Final Fantasy I on the NES, were not runaway Smash successes like they were in Japan, the introduction of a true blue Japanese role-playing game was formative for many people. We had been given tastes before, like the Dragon Quest games on NES, but otherwise, most of our RPG experience were on the Western front with games like Wizardry, The Bard's Tale, or Ultima. It feels impossible to conceptualize. JRPGs are one of the most beloved genres in gaming, but back in 1991, people were stepping into what was no longer a genre situating itself. No longer a genre evolving from water to begin walking on land. People were hearing the opening chorus of a type of game that would grip them for decades to come. It's not just that we got a taste of the future with Final Fantasy II US, but that we were getting the first taste of one of the golden ages in video gaming. The streak of standout JRPGs that came with the 16-bit era is still heralded as a high watermark even today, so many decades later. Breath of Fire, Illusion of Gaia, Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Earthbound, Secret of Mana, all of these games still hold weight today. While I was born too early to experience the start of Nintendo's 16-bit dominance, I have extremely fond memories of experiencing the back half. These first couple videos were about me discovering the beginnings of Final Fantasy during a time before I was even born, but now we inch closer to a point where I can start relating to them as they happened, as I was there for it. But all of these releases had to start somewhere, and this game came out only a couple months after America traded in 8 bits for 16. So I'm excited to be here today, taking my first step into history and playing the game that for so many launched an obsessive love for this genre. Today we look at what can be popularly considered the first real Final Fantasy as we discuss Square's debut on the Super Nintendo, Final Fantasy IV. Post-production Jay here. Uh, I need to quickly explain why I'm dogging on Final Fantasy 1, because I'm wrong and I know I'm wrong, but I'm still dogging on it. Final Fantasy 1 in North America was actually a huge success. It outsold Final Fantasy 1 in Japan, but I still dog on it because there's something about those sales that didn't seem to equate to like a, a cultural demand for Final Fantasy as a series the way it did in Japan. And again, I could I know I'm wrong in one sense, I could be wrong in a secondary sense, but it never seemed to pan out that way. So I've always been a little curious as to why. I can say that the sales for Final Fantasy 1 in North America could be attributed to the massive marketing push that Nintendo put on it. There was a huge amount of marketing to get people to play Final Fantasy 1, including was it uh, issue 17 of Nintendo Power being a full strategy guide. That's all that issue was, was a full fucking strategy guide for Final Fantasy 1. So you'll hear me across these videos downplay the success of FF1. There's a reason for why I think that is, because it just didn't translate into a successful bump up for Final Fantasy 2 US, Final Fantasy 3 US, and then we kind of all collectively got on board for Final Fantasy 7. Anyways, you, you'll see me again soon. After Final Fantasy 3, the FF team began working on another NES game in the series, as well as a Final Fantasy game for the fancy new Super Nintendo that was right around the corner. Originally, Final Fantasy IV started out as an NES game, but kicked FF5 down the line to become the first game on the series in 16-bit hardware. Now, it's a little up in the air how much of the FF4 NES was completed. It's been long assumed that it wasn't all that far along, seeing as how the only evidence we ever got was this mock-up of what FF4 NES could look like. However, in an issue of Dengeki Super Famicom, Sakaguchi reportedly said that he told a, and I quote, big fat lie, and that FF4 NES was more like 80% done. 
I'm not going to say I don't believe him, but if FF4 NES was really that far along, it's kind of sad that we know almost literally nothing about it. Was the game substantially different? Like, I would just kind of have to assume it is because moving into a new system probably afforded them more power than just making the graphics and music nicer. But alas, we will probably never know. As mentioned in the last episode during production, Hiromichi Tanaka wanted to branch out into a more action-focused game. While he was initially working on Final Fantasy IV, Tanaka switched development teams to work on Secret of Mana instead. While I have no reporting that says this person actually replaced him, someone new took up the role of lead designer for FF4, Takashi Tokita. Tokita had worked at Square for years at this point, mainly working with graphics and sound effects, but for Final Fantasy IV he was promoted to lead designer and scenario writer. There is a real argument to be made that Tokita's involvement in Final Fantasy IV paved the way for so much of the series' direction moving forward. Originally wanting to be a theater actor, Tokita was part-timing for Square until becoming full-time with Final Fantasy IV. There is no doubt that his history and experience with theater was at play when bumped into his new role as FF4 is the Final Fantasy game that contains its first real dramatic story. Tokita's original script for the game came in four times larger than the final product and had to be trimmed down to fit the game. But even with all that chopping, FF4 became the first true JRPG to have the style of story that the genre would be known for hereafter. While a lot of what makes this game special will be discussed in further segments, the reception FF4 got was outstanding. Tokita saw this game as a culmination of the Final Fantasies previous, the crystals from 1, the story from 2, and the jobs from 3. And I think he's correct in his assessment. To many people, Final Fantasy IV is the first real Final Fantasy, the game that would be able to take the building blocks from prior installments and craft a game that would go on to forever shift the perception of JRPGs. I think there's something to be said that this FF could be a bit of a changing of the guard. Sure, Sakaguchi, Uematsu, and Amano were still on board, but at this point, a lot of the early heavy hitters have left for their own projects. Gone are Kawazu, Ichi, Nasir, and now Tanaka. Final Fantasy IV, to me, feels like a very different game from the NES trilogy even though it still plays within the same sandbox of FF. I could see the exits and entrances to the development team being something that played into the change of flavor. I'm not trying to read too much into the gap of power between the NES and the SNES and what it offered the Square employees, but Final Fantasy IV is such a unique game to its predecessors that an internal change at the company may have been at work as well. The legacy of FF4 comes through in the bushel of versions it has, including the second ever Final Fantasy to make it stateside. The rundown of some of the more pertinent differences will be brought up in the following chapters, but Final Fantasy IV's popularity and age have led to many different styles of remake. The differences in the SNES original will be detailed in gameplay, but FF4 was also given a bit of a reworking for handhelds, appearing on the Wonderswan, the GBA, and this ugly fucking affront to god they released on the PSP. I'm so sorry, this backyard RPG Maker Weekend Jam art style feels like a slap in the face when put on a series as illustrious as Final Fucking Fantasy. This shit should be put in a first aid kit to help medically induce vomiting. I mean, Jesus Christ. I remember when this shit was coming out and I just like couldn't even look at it. It was like TV static for my brain, like a cognito hazard I was gazing at. Holy fuck. There's also a 3D remake of the style of Final Fantasy DS that went to mobile phones and PC. Gonna be real, uh, I also think this shit is offensively ugly. Much like FF3 3D Remake, a lot of additional changes and rebalancing happens to the game here, specifically regarding character abilities and spells. The GBA and PSP versions do have the most content with their bonus dungeons, and the PSP release comes with the FF4 sequel, The After Years as well as the lone appearance of the FF4 midquel interlude. Austin SV has a comprehensive breakdown of each release of Final Fantasy IV, and I highly recommend checking it out as there is so much going on between every version of the game, and it goes a long way in helping you figure out which Final Fantasy IV you will want to play. We are still sticking with the Pixel Remaster version for a variety of reasons, many of which to be discussed further in this video, but it would be improper to deny FF4 a glance at its shiny new coat. 
The original NES Final Fantasies all looked different, sure, but there was some noticeable overlap. For example, here's the FF1 Knight, Furion from FF2, and the FF3 Knight. Why, I'd say they must all be related. What's interesting when looking at Final Fantasy IV and continuing on to other SNES FFs is that is not the case. The team at Square were able to continue pushing the power of the system as the years went on, making Final Fantasy IV look different from what Final Fantasy VI would be. It's minor, but it's there. Final Fantasy IV has the flatness of an NES game, but with a more detailed color palette and greater ability towards sprite work. This isn't a knock on the game or anything, but you can see that they were probably playing with much nicer tools to expand on what they already knew, and as the series goes on into the 16-bit era, you will see the raw power the system was able to handle being used to its fuller potential. I will mention that this is the first Final Fantasy where the music really stuck out to me. Previous games have had some strong tunes and iconic themes, the overworld theme from 3 probably being the strongest example, but 4 is the first time I felt like a game had wall-to-wall -wall classics. Not only is the battle theme extremely powerful and charismatic, filling the player with heroic vigor, befitting of combat, but multiple other songs are so good at evoking the feelings needed. The prologue has this anthemic tone. Almost in step with how Dragon Quest has its iconic theme song, and not to spoil things, but the prologue plays again in the final battle to beautiful trophy effect. I know this song has been around since the initial game, but this was the first time it really stuck out to me. While Theme of Love never really stood out to me, it stood the fuck out to Japan. This song is so popular that in Japan it is one of the most beloved themes across the entire series and is added into Japanese music curriculum books. Another track that is so iconic that it would be remiss not to mention is the theme of the Red Wings. I'm not totally crazy about this tune, I think it is one of the big audio signifiers for this game. For a lot of people, when they think Final Fantasy IV, they think the theme of the Red Wings. Also, I need to stop pulling cuts, but like, I can't end this without talking about the airship theme. It 
It's a short loop, but it has such emotional power behind it. The audio sells this sense of adventure and freedom without overcommitting to a bombastic mood. Post-production Jay here again. I don't know how I missed this one, but I wrote all that about music and I didn't mention Battle with the Four Fiends, which is like an all-time fucking classic boss battle theme. It's unbelievable. There's this stomping pace that makes all of those fiends feel bigger than life. It's so cool. Everyone on the staff is firing on all cylinders for this game, and Uematsu is no exception. However, when it comes to presentation, we have an important topic that will permeate the next several mainline games. The translation. With Final Fantasy IV being the first story-heavy game in the series, we are entering a stretch where the efforts to take the game from Japanese to English are met with... Um... Roadblocks? Roadblocks. Now, this is the first big shock I learned about while doing this research. Famous slash infamous Square translator Ted Woolsey did not work on Final Fantasy IV's translation. I had always assumed he was part of this game, seeing how the iconic You Spoony Bard line feels like it could be a Woolseyism through and through. But apparently, the translation was performed by some Square employee who knew English. Woolsey, being the translator, was actually a response to the messy translation of FF4 as it took additional unrelated company hands to finish editing the whole deal, and Square was not exactly ecstatic about the final product. While not appearing in this game, it's probably as good of a time as ever to discuss Ted Woolsey further. Woolsey would act as translator for some of Square's biggest and most iconic works during the SNES era, including Secret of Mana, Breath of Fire, Super Mario RPG, Final Fantasy VI, and Chrono Trigger. Now, translation is very tricky business. Being able to take one language and warp it into another without losing anything is nearly impossible. This is why translation and localization exist as separate terms. Woolsey is a pioneer in taking the original script and modifying it in a way to make it more acceptably digestible for his Western audience. This practice has drawn both praise and criticism, as some believe his edits were able to greatly expand the accessibility of the genre, while others decry the original work being changed in such ways. While I'm sure each side has worthwhile arguments, I default to what I said earlier. It is nearly impossible to directly translate something. This goes tenfold for what Woolsey was working with in terms of technology, as the Japanese language requires significantly less written characters than English does. He can only have so many letters in the game, so the act of translating the work technologically required him to trim and edit and work around limitations. I, overall, have a neutral to positive opinion of Woolsey's work. I have no basis for what a more accurate translation would look like, nor do I know what I am maybe missing if someone else was doing the translation. But I can't see the man in a negative light because I grew up on SNES releases he translated. I have fond memories of Kefka's mannerisms or Gato's singing lyrics. I can't judge them objectively because extremely young Jay just loved the words he saw on the screen. And maybe that's the point. Woolsey was able to take a script written in a different language and make it enjoyable for children in the middle of the 90s. Sure, the art of translation and localization have advanced in the decades since. In fact, if you want more about Final Fantasy specifically, Legends of Localization has an extremely in-depth article on the game. But Woolsey was there first and helped get the cart moving. Also, before we move on, it should be mentioned that a very special someone appears in the series for the first time. A lowly debugger who would go on to become one of the biggest names in Final Fantasy. Tetsuya Nomura. Okay, before we get to the gameplay mechanics proper, we need to stop beating around the bush. 
While having a wonky translation isn't the death mark of a game from 1999, the reason I didn't opt to play the original SNES release is because it was made for thumb-sucking baby Americans. See, once I got past the first three games, I didn't feel the need to hang on to the Pixel remasters, and I was okay with playing the original versions, but after research, that doesn't seem to be the best path. Final Fantasy II US is significantly sanded down to make for an easier, but also less complex game. Multiple items are removed, prices are lowered, multiple magic spells are axed, various equipment attributes changed, and even some character abilities are fucking missing! Like, incredibly relevant abilities such as Rose's Prey, Yang's Focus, Tella's Recall, and Cecil's Darkness are gone! This is beans, dude, and I'm not interested in playing FF4 on Goo Goo Gaga difficulty. Japan also got FF4 Warm Milk and Nap Time Edition, but under the name Final Fantasy IV Easy Type. Now, Easy Type did actually come out before Final Fantasy II US, but reportedly FF2 US was in development first and Easy Type was made off of that mold instead of the other way around. No doubt it took a little longer to kick FF2 US out the door with the whole making it in another language thing. It is worth noting that the PS1 version of FF4 has a new translation and reverts many of the changes FF2 US got, but if you know anything about the Final Fantasy games on PS1, it's that they all suffer from garbage load times. As previously mentioned, there were many other reworkings of Final Fantasy IV that include various gameplay changes, but at the end of the day, I chose the Pixel Remaster once again, as I feel it gets me as close to the original without dealing with the archaic issues and rolls back many of the reworkings other, more modern versions brought. And this is probably the best time to mention that the Pixel Remasters are my preferred method for this reason across more than just FF4. Being able to get that close to the original without having negatively broken aspects is a huge slam dunk. Like this gets us FF4 without the removed abilities, FF2 without the needlessly masochistic systems, and FF1 without the spells that just don't work. Final Fantasy is a series of complex games and throughout a lot of their earlier years they showcase notable bugs and mistakes. The Pixel Remasters are liable to introduce their own bugs and mistakes, but cleaning up these legacy issues is something I vibe with. There will be one game I don't use the Pixel Remaster for, and even then, I will still be using a mod to help smooth that game out. On to gameplay proper. Final Fantasy IV introduces one of the longest running and most iconic systems in the franchise, the Active Time Battle. Pioneered by Hiroyuki Ito, the idea was to add a little more action into the flow of battles, creating a non-standard turn structure where both players and enemies could attack at their own speeds. Ito said his influence on this was from watching different speeds of cars pass each other during Formula 1 racing and implementing this as different characters having different speeds. This works with abilities as well, as different abilities can have different activation times. Unlike a standard attack, which happens as soon as you select it, some abilities have to sit and charge for a bit before they happen. This doesn't hold their turn in the order, so if you have someone be ready first and then do an ability that requires a charge time, and then a second person gets ready and just attacks, it's very possible the second person's attack will go off before the first person's ability does. It is worth noting that originally the ATB bar as we know and love was not there yet. FF4 just kinda alerted you when it was time to take your turn. Also noteworthy is the increased party size and different style of rows. Your party is now 5 characters deep and must be stacked in an offset style between front and back row. This is an interesting limitation as you have to plan around who is in your party to make good composition, lest you be stuck with an attacker in the back row being ineffective or a squishy support character in the front where they can be hit more often. Likewise, you don't change individual placements of the rows in battle anymore, you just do a full party flip. Hand in hand with the increased emphasis on story is the defined roles characters take. It sounds so banal to comment on it, but it's really the first time we have specialized characters who do not change their roles throughout the game. Once again, these will be brought up in the story as they show up, but FF4 makes a lot of hay with the characters and their definitions. Their abilities and jobs hold narrative weight in very interesting ways. For an example early in the story, there is a point where the party needs to pass an area blocked with ice, and while Rydia is learning black magic, she never learns fire. This is true in story and in gameplay. She learns the other basic elemental black magics, but you don't get her learning fire naturally through leveling. 
Another way this articulates that it really stuck out to me is a more focused vision of encounter design. Your party will fluctuate a lot, but because of the more linear structure based on emphasis of the narrative, the game will build encounters around what it knows your party will be. It's minor, but it's there. And coming from the previous three games that are designed with large open-endedness with regards to party composition, there feels like a shift being made in Final Fantasy IV. Our story begins with the aerial fleet of Baron, the Red Wings, returning from a mission. Our main character, Cecil, 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 Dark Knight and Captain of the Red Wings, is notably morose as a flashback shows that their mission was the violent taking of the water crystal from the city of Mysidia. Cecil and his crew do not agree with such bloody methods, but they are soldiers of the kingdom and the king's words dictate their actions. After fighting some monsters, Cecil returns to the Baron Kingdom, where the King's advisor, Bygone, basically snitches on Cecil once he detects that Cecil feels conflicted about the slaughter. Cecil asks for some clarity on the desires of the King, and, sensing defiance, the King strips Cecil of his command of the Red Wings. Now he gives Cecil another task, slay the Phantom Beast in Mist Cavern and take the Bomb Ring to the Village of Mist. Super Homeboy and Dragoon Kane busts in to ask the King to reconsider sending Cecil on such a dangerous mission. For speaking up, Kane gets his ass sent on the mission as well. While attempting to return to his quarters, Cecil is met by Rosa, who attempts to comfort him, but honestly, Cecil is kinda too depressed about slaughtering innocents at the moment. Rosa says she'll stop by later. We also meet airship engineer Sid, who is shocked to hear that the king removed you from the Red Wings and mentions the king has been acting strange lately. Cecil retires to his quarters and has to process the day, debating on how he can defy a king he once looked up to and who basically raised himself and Cain. Rosa enters to speak to Cecil, but again Cecil is really going through it as he explains his feelings on killing innocents, feeling like a coward for not being able to stand up against the king. Rosa tough loves him a bit, and I do mean love, as Rosa reveals they are an item. Wishing he comes back to her in one piece, Rosa lets Cecil sleep, and in the morning he and Kane depart for Mist. The Final Fantasy prologue rolls, and this intro fucking rules! Like, holy shit, this introduction is amazing. We immediately get the setup for the story. The King of Bairn is somewhat uncharacteristically hunting down these crystals. Cecil is a proud and loyal knight, but possesses enough emotions to be in turmoil over completing his orders. Cain is also a loyal knight, but his loyalty may be stronger towards his friendship with Cecil and the introduction of Rosa and Sid as other friendly characters. There's even a gameplay introduction, as the first couple fights that happen with the Red Wings are automated encounters designed to show off how the new ATB system works. But it gets better! There's a huge reward for chatting people up during this segment. You can learn from Kane that being a Dark Knight is seen as a higher rank, but Kane chose to be a Dragoon in dedication to his father. You learn that Rosa is a White Mage, and she became one to take care of her lover, Cecil. This dichotomy in class may also be a detriment, as Cecil mentions that as a Dark Knight, he and Rosa may never truly be able to be together. In under an hour, there is so much setup for plot and characters and motivation that it blows my fucking mind. Final Fantasy IV is out of the gates, putting all three previous entries combined to shame when it comes to crafting a narrative and it is one that immediately hooks you. You can see the conflicts playing as day. What sort of evil plan is the king up to? Is Cecil going to be able to defy someone he holds legitimate loyalty to? How will the relationship between Cecil and Rosa progress with their limitations? This shit is gas. It's got me by the neck and it didn't take much. It's a simple setup, but its simplicity does not betray its effectiveness. By the time the prologue rolls, you know who your characters are and why you would care about them. Also, shout outs to the Pixel Remaster for keeping the Something Awful reference from the super old, kinda crappy fan translation. Fucking hell, this is good shit. With Cecil and Kane out in the world, let's briefly discuss their abilities. Cecil can use darkness, sacrificing some of his health to damage all enemies on the screen. Kane can jump which allows him to spend a certain amount of time in the air and avoiding damage before coming down with a single powerful strike. 
Now that we are on ATB and not turn-based, I'm not exactly sure how long Kane stays up in the air, but it's not for a full ATB cycle. Traveling north, we find the Mist Cavern, a single-screen dungeon where an ominous voice warns them against proceeding. This is the Phantom Beast, the Mist Dragon, and we get our first boss battle. This is just a learning exercise. The dragon will occasionally go into mist form where it cannot be hit, and will do a counterattack if you do so. After defeating the Mist Dragon, you find the Village of Mist proper, and you do a genocide. Oops. Yeah, so the bomb ring, kinda unsurprisingly, goes off and bombs the entire Village of Mist. Cecil and Kane rush over when they hear the screaming of a child, seeing a little girl mourning her mother. But she wasn't killed because of the bombing. She was killed because she's a summoner, and her summon was defeated, killing her. Oh, I <laughs> I um wonder who 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 did that. Cecil and Kane try to protect the girl, but she engages them and shows off that she's a summoner as well, blasting the party with earthquake and caving in the mountainside. Cecil wakes up next to the girl and takes her to the nearest inn. While attempting to rest, more of the king's forces barge in in attempting to finish the job. The king has ordered the destruction of Mist to kill any and all summoners who lived there, and Cecil has had enough. He draws his blade against his kingdom. While the general is able to escape, the girl sees that Cecil is truthful about wanting to protect her, and she opens up to him. This is Rydia, a summoner. But much like what we saw in FF3, she can perform summoning magic, but she also gets access to white and black magic to boot. While in the town of Kaipo, we learn that a damsel from Baron was rescued and is in someone's house healing from sickness. That sounds like it could be Rosa. It's Rosa. She contracted a desert fever and we need to get the sand ruby to cure her, but that's held in a far cavern guarded by antlions. Traveling out of the desert, we are stopped by an old man looking for help. This is Sage Tella a magic user who needs additional hands to defeat a large creature stopping him from getting him to the city of Damsian, which is the direction we're heading in anyways. Tella is another mage like Rydia, but he has a special ability to recall. Recalling allows Tella to possibly cast a spell from a selection of magics, including ones he cannot normally use. However, sometimes he will not be able to remember and wastes a turn. Further in the cavern, we find a magic field that allows us to rest, use tents, and save. Tella has us turn in for the night as we get some backstory on him. His daughter, Anna, ran off to Damsian with a bard she was in love with, but Tella did not consent to the relationship. Now, the use of this midpoint for saving and healing is important because, unlike FF3, where I wouldn't shut up about it, FF4 has much more expansive dungeons. You've already gotten multiple tents by now, and it's likely you will use them, not only because there is more ground and thusly more battles to tackle, but it's the specific way battles are structured right now. So, to break it down, you have a somewhat unorthodox party at the moment. Two hard magic casters and a dark knight. Cecil being a main character that can attack all enemies with darkness is something the game accounts for, as the majority of your encounters are against multiple foes. It wants you to be constantly casting magic and possibly darkness as well to damage all baddies on the screen. Rydia and Tella can barely attack otherwise when on the back row, so it's not really feasible for Cecil to normal attack four dudes to death. You'll likely return to this point to tent up at least once so you can recover Rydia and Tella's MP, or if you get far enough, you're given a little piece of overworld to tent up and save while you're there. Also, just to make a point of it, we still have FF3 styled secret paths. At the end of the second cavern is the Octomammoth boss fight. There is nothing special about this. You simply damage him and over time he kind of changes his art to accommodate losing a tentacle. This changed nothing as far as I can tell. Look, there's Damsian. Oh, fuck. The party rushes into Damsian to find it completely bombed out, the bodies of its citizens half alive at best, and one body on the top floor belonging to Tella's daughter, Anna. Tella flies into a rage, fights the bard boyfriend, and this honestly is really cool. It uses the language of an encounter to act as a cutscene, but that's not why this cutscene is famous. Say the line, Bart! Yay! This bard is Prince Edward, and Anna's dying breaths are enough to get Tella off of him. The party watches as she passes, and we learn about the new leader of the Red Wings, a powerful general named Golbez. Tella swears revenge and claims he will kill Golbez himself, defiantly leaving the party to chase his quest. Cecil and Rydia team up with Edward, who gives us his hovercraft so we can get to the Antlion Cave. 
The antlion cave is similar to the waterway cavern, but noticeably shorter. And thank god, because Edward kinda sucks. As a bard, he has pretty below average attack. The ability to hide and just remove himself from battle for his own safety. The ability to heal the party, but doing so by splitting a potion equally and that's not a whole lot of healing power. And finally, he can sing to enemies and have a chance to debuff them with a status effect. We find the antlion's nest and Edward explains that the antlions are tame, so there's no danger. The antlion boss fight is no biggie. Thankfully, he deals weak physical damage and when struck he will counter with an even weaker attack. You can pretty easily bag him up without any real threat. With the sand ruby in hand, Edward wonders why the antlions are being hostile. Cecil mentions how the world is getting more and more overrun with monsters, which has been happening since the beginning of the game, and it seems like something bad is happening in the world to cause it. Thankfully with the hovercraft we can go back to Kaipo and heal Rosa with the sand ruby. She tells Cecil that she thought he was dead after the earthquake it missed, and went out to try and find him. She also talks about Golbez being someone the king personally appointed to the Red Wings and how she thinks Golbez is controlling the king to get the crystals. With two of the crystals snatched, the team needs to go to Fubal to prevent the next one. Rosa may still have a cough on her, but she joins the party next. At night we get an awesome cutscene of Edward morosely playing his harp and missing his lover, Anna. He gets jumped by a monster and has to do one-on-one -on -one battle with it, where the spirit of Anna appears to tell Edward that he has to be brave enough to help save the world. Edward is able to fight and win, afterwards seeing off the spirit of Anna as she passes to the realm beyond. To get to Fable, the crew has to pass Mount Hobbs, which presents a problem I kinda talked about in the gameplay section. Shit's blocked by a big ol' hunk of ice. Rydia does know black magic, but she never learned fire, despite it being one of the basics of black magic. Well, as someone who watched her town and fellow summoners get firebomb genocided, she understandably does not really want to learn fire and it takes Rosa encouraging her to harness the magic of fire and melt the ice block. There's a character beat I fucking love here. After melting the ice, Rydia giggles. Rydia has not had a whole lot of reasons to be happy, but something, be it the ability to get past her fear, or be it the childlike thrill of playing with fire, causes her to crack a tiny laugh. It's such a small thing, but it does wonders for adding that extra special sauce to Rydia. Once in Mount Hobbs, we get to see what Rosa is made of. She may be a white mage, but she's also an archer, allowing her to aim and deliver a charged up shot at one enemy. Aside from her standard white magic, she can also pray to heal the entire party for a sizable amount, but this does have a chance to fail. At the top of Mount Hobbs, we find a monk taking on a swath of baddies, dispatching them all without too much of an issue until faced with the boss bomb. The party leaps into action to help this monk, Yang. Yang is much like the Black Belt in FF3, able to focus up and do double damage on his next strike. Although this triggers automatically so you can't stack them. Doing damage against all enemies with Kick, and being able to boost his defense with GERD. I, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. The Mom Bomb is a bit of an ass kicker boss. The first phase is a standard fight, but when you see the bomb inflate you need to make sure that all your party's healed up to tank the explosion. From there, six bombs will be left that have to be cleared before the fight is over. It's very possible to have a character bursted down, so make sure you're on the up and up with the healing. After the fight, Yang tells the party that he was here training with his fellow monks, but they all fell before the monsters. The party alerts him to Golbez's plan for crystal-based domination, and they all leave together to get back to Fabul, as only the student monks are left in town to defend it at the moment. At Fabul, the kingdom plans for the attack of Baron, having Rosa and Rydia stay back as Yang, Edward, and Cecil go to the front lines to defend against the forces. It doesn't go so hot, and the team are constantly pushed further and further back, ending up in the Vault of the Crystal where who should enter but none other than Cain. He draws his weapon against Cecil in another great cutscene battle, but cannot bring himself to deliver the killing blow on his best friend. Golbez makes his appearance, chides Cain for not killing Cecil, fucks up Yang and Edward, kidnaps Rosa, and orders Cain to steal the crystal. The team has failed, and not only lost the third crystal, but Rosa as well. Planning their next move, Cecil says that Baron's proclivity towards aerial dominance means they have a weak naval presence. It's possible to sneak into Baron by boat and steal an airship with the help of Sid. 
the King of Fabul sets up a ship for us. Yang's really cool wife sees us off, and the team sails towards Baron. Check out these fucking water spray effects. That's beautiful. However, everything goes belly up when the boat runs into Leviathan. Rydia is knocked overboard, Yang dives afterwards, Edward falls over again, and Leviathan swallows up everything in a massive whirlpool. Cecil wakes up on the shore alone and completely unaware of his surroundings. Good news, there's a town nearby. Bad news, it's Mysidia, and people might still remember the fact that you personally slaughtered innocents there. They don't take kindly to you. I don't blame them. You talk to the elder of Mysidia for help, declaring your regret and lack of courage in betraying the initial orders. The elder will help, but not after dropping this fucking bomb of a line. Your words will not bring back our dead. Jesus. The elder directs you to climb the on the nosely named Mount Ordeals in order to better yourself. Yes, this is a distraction from your goals of finding your friends and saving Rosa and also the world, but the elder impresses that continuing down the path of being a dark knight is not wise, and that the completion of Mount Ordeals will change your darkness into light. You will not be alone as the elder instructs two apprentice mages to join you, the twins Palam and Porum. Just look at these little shitters, fucking rascals. Palam and Porum are a male black mage and female white mage, respectively, but they both have some additional abilities. Palam can bluff to increase his intelligence and thusly his damage. He doesn't seem to have much of a problem with that right now, though. And Porum can cry, which flusters the enemy and I, I, I guess makes you escape battles easier. It's really not obvious what this does in game and the original it would make it easier to steal from enemies which is funny because we don't have a character who can do that most relevantly though is their twin cast ability having any of the twins use twin cast will lock them both into charging up a special more potent damage spell as we approach Mount Ordeals and see the twins goofing around more, we get a very Saturday morning cartoon shot of Golbez and Kane and a tied up Rosa. Golbez is aware that Cecil is climbing the Ordeal Mountain to trade in his darkness and summons Scar Miglione of Earth, one of the four elemental lords, to stop Cecil. Kane wishes to get a second chance at defeating Cecil, but Golbez kind of still has him in timeout for not finishing the job the first time around. In Mount Ordeals, we find Tella, who is looking for the powerful magic of Meteor. This spell is strong enough to bring down Golbez, but the vitality required to cast it will likely be the end for Tella, a sacrifice he is very willing to make. He joins your party as you all continue the climb. At the top of the mountain, you fight Scar Miglione and his undead soldiers. It's not that difficult. Alas, it was but a ruse. He comes back in his final form, attacks your back row, and it's still not that difficult because two shots of twin cast pretty much immediately earths him. This shit does crazy damage, like Christ. My son. What? A spiritual voice speaks out to Cecil and tells him to fight the darkness inside. Cecil embraces his new holy blade and becomes a paladin, doing cutscene battle with his former self. Cecil, newly classed, has some legitimate questions about the whole my son deal and wonders who was that familiar voice. The twins are about to tell him something as they've seemingly not been upfront about, but they are interrupted by Tella remembering all his spells, goodbye recall ability, and in fact learning Meteor. Full of piss and vinegar, Tella charges off to go end Golbez and the gang follows after him not being able to unveil to Cecil whatever the twins were about to mention. Also, now as a pally, Cecil no longer has the darkness attack and instead can learn low-level white magic, as well as being able to cover an ally and tank any attack they would normally receive. Cover will automatically trigger when anyone gets into red life as well. This is interesting to me because it makes our big hero as much of a support character. He still has the ability to attack for good damage, but I think throughout the game, he has worth being a defensive role, which isn't something we often see in a protagonist. Getting back to Mysidia, the Elder congratulates Cecil on becoming a paladin, and when he brings up his whole confusion over the my son thing, the Elder relates a Mysidian legend about the Chosen One. The twins cough up that they were as much spying on you as they were helping you to make sure that you were as changed as you claim to be, and Tella is like, okay, that's fucking cool. Can we get to the killing Golbez part now? Tella is laser guided on his revenge plot, and he isn't letting any whippersnappers get in his way. 
The Elder opens up the Devil's Road, which is a fucking magical portal, I guess, that they have that teleports you directly into the town of Baron. That's convenient. Man, speaking of convenient, buckle up. Cecil finds Yang at the bar commanding some Baron soldiers. After you beat them, you have to do battle with Yang himself. After you smack him around a little bit, he comes to his senses. Apparently, he remembers nothing after the Leviathan encounter and has been under some sort of amnesia or brainwashing or whatnot that made him like a ranking personnel in within Baron's forces. And to prove this, he has the Baron key, which allows the party to get through the locked doors in the kingdom. How convenient! There is a small waterway dungeon that allows you to get into the castle through the backside. Once inside, you meet Bygone, who has lost all of his forces trying to defend the kingdom and joins up with you. Seeing how Bygone has spent 0% of the time on screen being trustworthy, the twins immediately sniff him out as a snake, and we get a fucking whopper of a boss battle. Bygone is a tough fight. He has two arms that add to the attacks, and if you defeat both of them, Bygone will regenerate them anew. This is tedious, but not insurmountable. What is a much bigger kick in the pants is that after you hit him with a magic spell, you know, the, the best form of offense you have right now, he will cast Reflect on himself. This makes for a long and arduous battle as Cecil and Yang need to be your primary damage dealers as Tella and the twins support, heal, and occasionally attempt to damage with risky spells. Easily, this was the hardest boss fight so far. After beating Bygone, you enter the throne room and confront the king. This turns out to be the second elemental lord, Cagnazzo of Water. He has been the one impersonating the king this whole time and aiding Golbez. This fight is much, much easier. Being the elemental lord of water means that Tella and Palam fry his ass to death with thunder spells and kinda dog walk him pretty badly. After the fight, Sid comes busting in, stubborn and looking for a fight but we already took care of the Imposter King. He meets the party, as well as the older, more stubborn, and even more looking for a fight, Tella. While attempting to leave, Cagnazzo pulls one last trap from the Netherworld, closing the walls in on the gang to kill them all. Before the walls get too close, the twins sacrifice themselves by holding back the walls and casting stone on each other, stopping the walls from moving any further. Tella actually tries to cast Isuna on them and bring them back, but because it was done by the twins' own volition, the Isuna doesn't work. Swearing even more vengeance, the party continues on to Sid's remaining hidden airship. Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom, Golbez and Kane discuss Cecil beating Cagnazzo and come up with an idea for the last crystal. They will have Cecil get the Earth Crystal and exchange it to them for Rosa. Golbez is still gonna kill Cecil after the exchange. Like, come on, like, did you forget who you're dealing with here? Kane leaves to deliver the message, and as Sid gets his secret ship, the Enterprise, into the air, Kane flags them down. He relays the message to Cecil, and the party now know their next objective. We hit our classic Final Fantasy moment of the world opening up to explore. While I did find a couple towns that were new, I was mostly interested in the remains of Castle Eblen. This destroyed kingdom has been picked over, but many chests of loot still remain for the taking. That is, until you get the doors blown off of you by some of the dangerous encounters hiding within. I don't know if this was a place I was supposed to come back to, but spurred on by wanting the goodies, I grinded the tough enemies nearby so I could get all the chests inside. We should talk about Sid now. He's pretty simple. Sid is a physical powerhouse who can attack for big damage, and his only unique ability is to scan, giving us the enemy's HP and any weaknesses they may have. Frustratingly, this doesn't seem to work on bosses, which would be the one time it's the most useful. Other than that, he just has the best animations. Like, look at this dude big cheesin'. What was fun is that I really only needed to grind to just survive a bit, and then I had ways to battle other than brute strength. The Mad Ogres were so fast, hard-hitting, and nullified magic attacks, so after a wipe or two, I came back, casted Stop on all of them, and made Child's Play of it. Felt great! Eventually, you find the Kingdom of Troya. The clerics alert you that the Earth Crystal has already been taken by a Dark Elf, and is being stashed away in the Magnetic Cavern. We also hear from some Kingdom Denizens that a traveling bard is in the castle healing up. That sounds like Edward. It's Edward. He is a complete wreck and being tended to while still being bedridden with injury. As much as he wishes he could get back to adventuring, 
all he can do for now is hand Cecil the twin harp. Now Magnetic Cavern cannot be accessed by foot or by airship, so you have to find the nearby Chocobo village and hop on not a regular Chocobo, but a black Chocobo. These friends are capable of local flight and can land you within the forest surrounding the Magnetic Cavern. Are you ready for a gimmick dungeon? The Magnetic Cavern is filled with powerful magnetism from the Dark Elf, meaning any metal armor will paralyze your party. This also makes it so you need to retool your party's method, primarily with Sid and Cecil becoming bowmen. Honestly, this works really well and was an interesting diversion from how you normally play the characters. At the end, we face off against the Dark Elf, who fucking smokes the entire party with multi-blasts of elemental magics. Cecil is truly powerless without his sword, and the gang is defeated. Back at Troya, Edward can sense that the crew is in danger, and with all the might left, he gets out of his bed to find his harp. He plays a melody that resonates through the twin harp, negating the magnetism in the cavern and getting our heroes back in the fight. The Dark Elf is much less dangerous now, and even his multi-blast of elemental magic is more easily shrugged off. The song will continue to play throughout the boss battle, which is a beautiful touch. Until the second phase, where the Dark Elf morphs into the Dark Dragon, and we get a traditional boss battle theme. The dragon form is no trump card, as Cecil and the crew mop him up, get the crystal, and leg it back to Troya. Returning to the Troya infirmary, we get another cutscene with Edward. He's still too weak to join back with the party, but everyone thanks him for his actions. Importantly, this includes Tella, who buries the hatchet with the Spoonie Bard and can finally realize what was in Edward that Anna saw. Cecil takes the crystal to the clerics, but Kane interrupts and says it's time for the trade. He will grab the party, take them to the Tower of Zot, and we can hand off the final crystal for Rosa's safety. The Tower of Zot is a blistering techno fortress with some really devilish enemies you have to navigate. I was initially worried that I would have grinded over the curve thanks to Castle Eblin, but thankfully this was not the case. A lot of these random encounters are still no joke, and I even got to the point where I was under duress because Tella ran out of MP, I had no more ethers, and there wasn't a save point I could tent at yet. That said, towards the end of the tower there is some extra traversal you can do to net some excellent equipment for everybody. Before we can make it in to see Golbez, we are accosted by the Emissaries of Barbaricia, the Elemental Lord of Wind. Mindy, Cindy, and Sandy, the Magus sisters. This boss fight feels like it should have been tricky, but either through dumb luck or crappy AI decisions, it was kind of made into a breeze for me. So Mindy casts Reflect on Cindy, which screwed up a lot of my ability to cast magic on all of them, but then she kept casting it. Every time Mindy casts Reflect on Cindy, Cindy inadvertently reflects it onto one of my party. While this did make it so I couldn't cast all for protect or something, the majority of my party was now protected from their magical attacks and I was able to start picking them apart. Nice try girls, but Cecil's got someone to save. Inside is Golbez, you give him the crystal, he gives you a middle finger and blows you a raspberry. Tella, who has been near boiling point for hours now, pushes Cecil's pansy ass out of the way and takes Golbez mano a mano. As he begins casting high-powered magic with real damage value, I need to admit that I've been burying the lead on Tella a bit. From the second Tella entered your party at the beginning of the game, he has had 90 MP. No matter how much leveling you do, his MP never increases. This is all to a point, because you can actually learn Meteor as a spell you can cast, but it costs 99 MP, and Tella only has 90. So when Tella burns through his spells and he hasn't done the trick, his decision to cast Meteor means something. You know it's not normally possible because it's been not normally possible ever since Tella learned it. But Tella is so hell-bent on defeating Golbez that he has a foot in the grave for so much of the story. It's going to kill him to cast Meteor, but he's going to do it anyways. When Meteor hits Golbez for 9999, it feels like a punch to the chest. Golbez is able to tank Meteor, but it's done a fucking number on him and shattered his control spell on Kane. Even as Golbez runs to fight another day, Cecil confronts him, and while Golbez is still able to blast Cecil back, it's apparent to both parties that Golbez is significantly damaged. Golbez escapes, and the crew rush to be with Tella in his final moments, despondent that he wasn't able to avenge his daughter in his sacrifice. As he passes, 
Cecil vows to get vengeance not just for Anna, but for Tella as well. You rouse Kane, who feels guilt for actions made not under his control, and everyone rushes in to save Rosa from the chopping block. Rosa and Cecil embrace, a gesture a little too complicated for the art to bear, but it's felt by its intention. Did you really think you were getting out of here without another boss battle? Barbaricia appears to block your path. So Barbaricia's gimmick is that she will guard herself with violent winds, and they can only be undone by Kane hitting her with a jump. While the wind is enough to rebuke most characters, Sid was actually able to continue scoring noticeable damage even when she was winded up. Outside of some annoying tornado casts, she goes down without too much of an issue. After the fight, Barbaricia intends to crash the tower, so Rosa teleports the party out and back into Kane's old bedroom. Here, Kane gives us the next bit of information. Golbez may have the four crystals, but those are only the light crystals. There are actually four more dark crystals in the underworld, and Golbez needs those two for his plan, which is making a bridge to the moon. Kane was able to snag a key to open up the underworld, but the team needs to find where to use it. The town of Argent has what is apparently the world's deepest well, so if you drop the magma rock down their tourist trap, it blows up the nearby mountainside in a volcanic fury and reveals a large hole to the underworld. Entering the underworld, we find that Golbez has already beaten us here, as the Enterprise gets stuck between the Red Wings and some grounded tank units. Sid says we gotta land the old bird due to the damage, so we park it next to the Dwarf Kingdom. Inside here, we meet King Gyat, leader of the dwarves and bearer of bad news because it looks like Golbez already snagged two of the four Dark Crystals. Sid leaves the party so he can tend to the Enterprise, and King Gyat tells us the third Dark Crystal is safe in a vault behind him. Oh fuck, what is that? Earlier we met Luca, who lost one of her dolls. I hate to tell you, but we found them. You smash the dolls until a couple are left, and they turn into the actual boss, Calcabrenna. She can glare your party to confuse them, but thankfully with Rosa and Cecil on Asuna duty, you can keep this a fair fight and defeat her. The dolls did their job even in loss, as Golbez now knows of the room and he teleports in. Amused by your progress, he offers to tell you his plan. He needs all eight crystals to reactivate the Tower of Babel, which will open a path to the moon. Legends say a power beyond comprehension lies up there, and Golbez wants it. Golbez attacks the party, binding them all quickly and summoning a shadow dragon to finish the job. Before it can kill Cecil, the mist dragon appears to fight it off. That's right, Rydia is back. Together, you can defeat Golbez. After the fight, Rydia explains that Leviathan took her to the Land of Summons. She was taught great power while there, but lost the ability to do white magic anymore. Also, time is a little Jeremy bear me there, so she's come back a little older. Golbez, while defeated, is not done. All that's left is his arm, but he pulls an Adam's Family thing and still manages to get the seventh crystal. King Giat lets us know that the last crystal is in the sealed cavern, but instead of going there, he has a different plan. By distracting Golbez's forces with his tanks, he wants your team to enter the Tower of Babel and take the other seven crystals before Golbez gets back. Ducking around the tank fire, the crew enters the Tower of Babel, which looks exactly like the Tower of Zot. In fact, many of the enemies here are the same ones from that dungeon. The Tower of Babel is longer than average, especially if you are trying to hunt for all the treasures, so the dungeon does give you two save points to heal at. There is a very important looking locked door we can't get past, so pressed further into the dungeon elsewhere has us run into the last elemental lord, Rubicante, and Dr. Lugay. Our first battle with the good doctor and his Frankenstein's monster is a big nothing. Even when he changes phases and pilots it manually, there's nothing much going on. But that's all because the second fight with Dr. Lugay is the real one. The doctor will continuously poison the entire party, and when you attack him, he will counterattack with sleeping gas. Normally, this is a little too much to keep up with, but to make the fight tolerable, he will actually do a full status heal on your team after a while. It's really annoying having to circumvent all the sleep counters, but with enough effort, we beat the doctor and get the key for downstairs. Inside the room, we smack around the goblins who are controlling the cannons. However, before they are defeated, they destroy the controls to the cannons. I'll be honest, this is not properly explained, but it seems that destroying the controls makes it so you can't stop the cannons from attacking, but also that the room is going to explode. 
which is why Yang sacrifices himself in the room to do something. Presumably find a way to turn off the cannons, but again, there's nothing being said about what's actually happening here. Golbez taunts you as you leave the tower, destroying the bridge and sending your party tumbling. Thankfully, Sid flies in in the nick of time to scoop everyone up. The rescue is short-lived as the Red Wings give chase. In another move of incongruous self-sacrifice, Sid pilots the Enterprise out of the hole to the overworld and jumps overboard with a bomb so he can collapse the passage behind us. Everyone chooses death too hastily. God damn, if you ain't right, Kane. Back at Baron, Sid's boys attach a hook on the Enterprise so we can take our hovercraft wherever we want. Back at the Kingdom of Eblin, you can use the hovercraft to access the Cave of Eblin. Inside the cave, we find the remaining survivors of Eblin in rough condition. The Prince of Eblin has gone in through the cave to get to the Tower of Babel and defeat Rubicante. After a quick cavern hike, we see this man, the Ninja Prince Edge, ripped straight out of your notebook doodles from when you were 13, take on Rubicante, and get trounced. Even more embarrassing, Edge casts flame on Rubicante, it heals him instead, and Rubicante insults him for being such a dummy. After Rubicante leaves, the party is able to heal Edge, and after some tears from Rydia about companions they've lost so far, Edge joins the team, even if he is a bit of a lech. Edge does some ninja bullshit to get us back into the Tower of Babel, where the encounters inside have changed up. Like ninjas previous, Edge can throw weapons for big damage. What rounds out his abilities is to steal like a thief and to have his own bespoke elemental magic in the form of ninjutsu. He's honestly not the most survivable frontliner because of how squishy he is, but he's gonna have to do as he rounds out your party. Getting through the tower, Edge is met by his parents. This fight against them is a cutscene one, so even though you keep swinging, it's not gonna do anything. The monster parents are eventually woken out of their spell and tell Edge they are no longer to be part of this world, bidding him goodbye. Rubicante appears and actually apologizes. The wicked monstrification of Edge's parents was Dr. Luge overstepping his bounds. Rubicante, while evil, is a very fair person. He heals the party before we do battle. Rubicante, the last of the elemental lords, is no joke. He is weak to ice attacks when he opens up his cloak, but when his cloak is closed, he will heal off of them instead. He can actually cast Blizzara on himself to perform a heal when needed. It's somewhat difficult to get Edge and Rydia in the correct rhythm to strike when his cloak is open, but it's more difficult keeping them alive at all. When Rubicante opens his cloak, he is often about to cast Inferno, which will 100% smoke the fuck out of a party member. It's a tough battle, but Cecil and his team end up on top with Rubicante defeated, but not done for. He applauds your strength and dips out. Edge's compatriots show up to help him out a little late, including yet another hot-headed old-timer. This game loves the elderly biting off more than they can chew. While Edge should go back home and rebuild Eblon, he joins the party to make sure Golbez is defeated. We made it to the crystals! No, fuck we didn't! I'm getting a little bit tired of this place. After a couple floors of searching, we find an enemy airship and decide to hop on it. Isn't that stealing? Rydia, it looks like you could use a little bit more time growing up in the land of summons. Since we are back in the underworld, we visit King Giat and report back that we didn't get those seven crystals. New plan, take the key to the sealed cavern, which is Luca's necklace, and defend the crystal there. In the infirmary, we see that Sid is somehow alive, if maybe just a little battered. Sid wonders who this ninja douchebag is, and we see that Edge is really just a chuny who hopes to god Rydia is impressed with him. Sadly, because we have an enemy ship and not the majestic Enterprise, we can't fly over lava, but Sid leaps out of bed to get the fix for that issue. Afterwards, there's this stinger that makes it seem like Sid is about to pass or something, but he's just sleepy. I fucking love this guy. Since this is our first real chance to explore the underworld, we have some places we can hit up. There is the town of Tamra, where we can get some equipment upgrades, but more importantly, there are some bonus dungeons. The Cave of Summons is the zone Rydia went through during her time away, which is crazy because this dungeon is fucking buff. All of the encounters here are difficult, between being decently powerful and liberal with status ailments. The most funny thing is being a fight where Cecil got confused, but casted teleport on the party to inadvertently let us escape. 
Also, the floor is lava, and Rosa needs to cast Float on the team so we don't take damage. This needs to be reapplied every floor. Once you make it to the land of summons proper, everyone is like, Guys, 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 Rydia's back! Oh man, Rydia's back! Welcome back, Rydia! To get the help of the king and queen of summons, you must defeat them in battle. Up first is Queen Asura, and this fight is a fucking barn burner. Asura is extremely tanky and constantly casting buffs on herself. If you can cast Reflect on Asura, it will stop the buffs and heals, which makes this fight even remotely fair. I was never able to tell what the deal was with each face of Asura, but often they did big damage at certain points, wiping Edge off the face of the earth with a single blow. Cecil was able to easily tank any strike, so eventually I got into a rhythm where Rydia, Rosa, and Edge were all in red health, and Cecil would automatically block any attack towards them for minor damage. It took a while to whittle her down, but eventually you defeat Asura and get her summon. King Leviathan is a much easier fight. Depending on which way he's facing, he will either cast Tidal Wave or cast Blazara, both of which can be mitigated with smart play. Much like Asura, he is a tanky fucker, and this fight takes forever to finish, including blowing a couple of ethers on a Rydia who came into this fight with full MP. Upon his defeat, Rydia gets his summon as well. I'd love to be done, but there's another bonus dungeon. The Sylvian Cave can suck me sideways. It's even larger and more confusing with more annoying encounters. Likewise, the floor is again lava, but because traversing through the dungeon is so windy, you are constantly reapplying float. And if you think you can get away without it, you can't. There is no boss in this dungeon. Instead, you get six monster bosses with decent enough goodies inside. Back to the plot. We head to the sealed cavern and we use Luca's necklace to enter. Thankfully, after my excursions, the rank and file encounters here are pretty easy to mow through. The gimmick for this dungeon is that every door is a trap door. Oh god, you thought the trap shoes were the end of the line? What will they fucking think of next? My party can pretty consistently one turn these dudes, which is good because the sealed cavern is lousy with them. It's not just trap doors in the way of your progress, but trap doors that lead to nothing. But sometimes they lead to something, so you gotta go through the motions. At the end of the cavern is the final dark crystal, which we actually collect. Wow, this is like the first one we've successfully nabbed, right? As the party leaves, the walls start to close in on them. Like we were getting out of here without a boss fight. Now, you want to talk about Final Fantasy icons. Moogles, Chocobos, Malboros, get that shit out of here. We got a true classic in the form of the Demon Wall. This battle is a DPS race because he's constantly getting closer and I wasn't about to find out what happens. I had Rosa haste as many people as possible, and everyone just dumped their biggest strikes turn over turn to make it out before the demon wall got too close. Back at the entrance of the dungeon, it seems that Golbez still has a level of mind control over Kane as he demands Kane take the final crystal and bring it to him. With all eight crystals in his possession, the Tower of Babel lights up like a lightning rod. Back with King Gyatz, you report your failure AGAIN, and he says that the only thing that could possibly help now is the legend of the Lunar Whale. Alas, it was just a rumor from the fabled Mysidia. Mysidia? Oh, that's a real place, I've been there. It's WHAT?! To get back to the overworld, Sid AGAIN leaps out of his hospital bed to install the ship upgrade. This time he works on installing a large drill. Edge helps out too, but Sid pulls him by the ear after he flaps his wings a little too much towards Rydia. Busting through the mountainside, AGAIN! The people of Argent have to be getting tired of this! We trip to Mysidia where the Elder is waiting for us. Everyone prays for the Lunar Whale, and a behemoth of a ship comes out of the water. Time to play the clip I've been holding on to for this whole video. Woohoo! Clear the launch way, man! We're taking this baby to the moon! Or not just yet. We got to clean up a couple things. There's a cave where you can trade the rat tail for adamantite, meaning you can get the underworld smithy to snap out of his doldrums and craft you up a new sword, Excalibur. Holy shit, what a jump. There's another side quest you do where you assist Yang's wife in waking up Yang, who is alive and being cared for by the Sliffs in that bastard of a dungeon. But it never triggered for me. I must have missed some sort of flag, but Yang's wife is the one that starts the side quest, and even after going to the Sylvan Cavern again to make confirmation that Yang is still very much not dead, I still couldn't get the quest to fire off. 
I guess that means it's time to... Hold on tight there, Cheat! We're blasting off into the moon! Welcome to the moon. It's a smaller area, but filled with absolute butt-puncher enemies. None of these battles you are exiting unscathed, so having 99 high potions for post-fight healing is highly recommended. You have to travel through a couple quick caves to make it to this large crystal palace, where within you find a Lunarian by the name of Fusoya. He expositions about the sleeping Lunarians who await Earth's further evolution and how one of them, by the name of Zemis, is trying to destroy the Earth by corrupting those on it. This is, of course, the power behind Golbez and the collection of the crystals. Busoya also says that the Devil's Road, the technology of airships, and the Lunar Whale are all inventions by his brother, Kluya, who also fathered two children, one of which is Cecil. To stop Golbez slash Zemis' plan of activating the Giant of Babel, Fusoya joins our party as he can get past all of the energy the Tower of Babel is currently admitting. But before we jet back to Earth, we have one bonus dungeon to do. The Cave of Bahamut is tough, but we can see Fusoya in action. He is a powerful mage capable of casting the most high-level white and black magic, but his unique ability is that he can cast an HP regen on the party. He also goes squish when he is dead. The real shit stopper of this cave is the final stretch, where you do back to back to back encounters with Behemoth. This dude hits like a speeding truck and will blast characters into low orbit if given the chance. Having protects and blinks up is a must to survive this physical onslaught. Thankfully, the Bahamut fight itself is more of a puzzle gimmick. He gives you a countdown before casting Mega Flare, in which you mostly have the time to get reflect on all your party members. Once everyone is reflected, the fight is basically over and Rydia gets the Bahamut summon. Getting back to Earth, we find that we are too late. The Giant of Babel is out and fucking shit up. All is not lost, as dwarven tanks attack the Giant, led by the dwarves and a very much alive Yang. Airships converge in as well, as Sid leads an aerial assault joined by the freshly unstoned twins and Edward. Cecil gets Sid to fly us into the giant so we can take him out from the inside. The giant is a short dungeon with high-powered encounters, but the pacing feels intense, like you are racing towards something important. You meet with the four elemental lords again, as Zemis has revived all of them, and you do a marathon boss battle. This is one long fight with Scarmiglione, Cagnazzo, Barbaricia, and Rubicante in that order with no breaks. Using each of their elemental weaknesses helps the fight along, but it's really a war to make sure you do not blow your tank on all your MP. You have to ration yourself to survive the length of the battle. Sadly, when it comes to surviving, Rydia did not make it across the finish line. Afterwards, we get a much easier boss fight, the CPU of the Giant. Fusoya all but spells out how to win this fight, and if that wasn't enough, the first move is the defense core healing the CPU. You kill the defense core, buff up against the attack core but don't kill it, and then just bop on the CPU until it dies. You can't use magic as it becomes pre-attached with reflect. Once the CPU is defeated, you can mop up the attack core and be done with it. Golbez runs in like, what the fuck man, and Fusoya approaches to tell Golbez to wake up. Fusoya breaks the control Zemis has over Golbez, and Golbez remembers who he is, the other son of the Lunarian Kluya, meaning that he and Cecil are brothers. Golbez and Fusoya leave to fight Zemis, and Cecil leaves the conversation to come to grips with this shit. He has a brother? He has been fighting with such hatred against someone who is his own flesh and blood. The giant is about to topple, but Cecil's kinda still in shock. Thankfully, Super Homie Kane arrives again to guide us out. Back at the Lunar Whale, the team clue in Kane on what went down. Cecil tells Rosa and Riddy to leave as they are going back to the moon. It's too dangerous for them. Bro, what are you doing? I need those party members! However, when back on the moon, you see that Rosa and Riddy are stowed away and they are coming along, damn it. Cecil gets to be a bit more open with his feelings and he swears on his life to protect Rosa. Real quick though, Go back to Earth and find the basement throw room in Castle Baron. Here is the King, reborn as a powerful summon. You do a sprint of a battle where you DPS race him before he auto-wipes your party. Successfully beating the race will net Rydia the Odin summon. Back on the moon and inside the Crystal Palace, you go behind where you met Fusoya and see all the crystals. They take you to the lunar subterrain. 
the final dungeon. The Lunar Subterrain might be one of the best final dungeons I've ever played. It's so perfectly tuned. The travel is long and winding, but never overly confusing. The path is mostly linear, but there are enough interesting diversions to explore, and most of them yield monster boxes which have excellent endgame gear in them. The random encounters are not difficult, but just a little too tanky to be ignorable. You can either fight them or run from them, and both options feel correct. There are also some mini-bosses guarding super endgame gear, like the White Dragon who I boxed up, or Dark Bahamut who immediately sent me to the Land of Ghosts and Whispers. This mini-boss is so tough that you get a save point right before it. It starts the fight off with a Mega Flare that will nuke almost everyone in the party, and then from there it can do the same bullshit you do on other bosses, casting Reflect on itself and then targeting itself with spells to bounce them onto you. This is almost a callback to a Final Fantasy 3 style boss, because Dark Brandon will only do self flares for the rest of the battle and you have to find a way to stabilize the DPS and mount a comeback. You can't try to dispel his reflect or he immediately reapplies it and you can't use Radia to go over the reflect with a summon because you will immediately get counterattacked by a Mega Flare. It took a couple of attempts, but eventually I was able to stabilize my team and become a well-oiled machine, never letting anyone get low on health and keeping the front line attacking. I won, but not before Dark Bahamer nuked Rosa the turn before, making her lose out on the experience. For your reward, you get the Ragnarok, an endgame sword that makes Excalibur look like a prop from Halloween Spirit. There's other gear mini-bosses. The Plague Fight is a bit of a sprint like the Odin Fight, but this time you are trying to outrace constant Doom casts. The Lunasaurus Fight is a bit of a runback of the Dark Bahamut Fight where they do the Reflect shenanigans. The Ogopogo Fight has him span multiple tidal waves to keep the party's health low, but not disastrously low. Even some of the regular fights are interesting. There's the Little Murderer who starts the fight by scanning himself to tell you his HP and weakness. Once you attack him, he says he's tricked you, but I immediately earthed him anyways. There's the Wicked Mask, who starts the fight by casting Reflect on himself, but also casting Reflect on you, making for a confusing battle on how you actually go about spell casting because everything is reversed. Some spells can still be bounced properly, but trying to accurately bounce healing is a new wrinkle in an encounter. The Lunar Subterrain does a thing so few games are able to do, I don't get tired of being here and just want to run to the end. It's the end of the game. It's obvious that this is the home stretch, but the pacing and design of Final Fantasy IV is so fucking strong and so fucking well realized that even in the 11th hour, I don't feel overly eyes in the prize. Everything in this dungeon is engaging and worth your time, if not for the interesting encounters, then for the super relevant gear you collect. It's a fucking masterpiece, dude. But finally, after so many levels of traversal, we get to the bottom of the Lunar Subterrain. We see Golbez and Fusoya take on Zemis, defeating him with their double meteor. Well, shit. Looks like the deed is done. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. As the newly formed Zeramis lays waste to the party, we cut back to Earth where the rest of the cast begins praying for everyone. Cecil still stands, and his brother Golbez hands him the crystal he is too corrupted with darkness to use. Battered, bruised, but not out of the fight, Cecil and the party approach Zeramis, being healed up by the previous party members' prayers, including an appearance from Tella, who I have to be really honest about and say that I felt something seeing him again. Many of these party members have been story dead for kind of whiffy reasons, but Tella's death was real. So seeing him here, healing you with his prayers, actually hits home. The party is revived, but Zeramis is playing with time, making all magic and attacks useless. Cecil has to use the crystal Golbez gave him to trigger Zeramis' final form, and for the last boss fight of the game to truly begin. Fuck Zeramis, bro. He casts extremely powerful and rather visually impressive spells like Big Bang over and over again. He will also cast a black hole to remove any and all spell effects currently on the party. This fight is tough as nails, and I definitely got unlucky and wiped to his big bangs. This starts a long tradition in JRPGs, where you lose a fight and have five of God's own minutes you have to wade through to get to another crack at him thanks to all the cutscenes. 
it's very difficult to stabilize against this amount of damage. Zeramis is so fast with his attacks that it's possible that he just doubles up and wipes you before you have a chance to retaliate. This boss fight is fucking diabolical. You are practically living and dying by whether Zeramis either black holes or does bio on everyone for a normal amount of damage. I actually took a break to exit the dungeon, item up, and then regrind my way in to boost my levels a bit higher because I was not cutting the mustard. This fight is still absolutely vile, and I was never able to properly stabilize my party. But with enough grit, I was able to defeat Zeromis, and I feel damn good for doing so. The first three FF bosses are kinda lame. Either bloated with overpowered stats, cheesable because why fucking fight them, or boring level checks. But Zeromis was a fucking fight, and it's a fight I had a number of tries with before I won. With Zeromis defeated, the world is saved. Fusoya leaves to stay on the moon, and Golbez asks to join, knowing that he cannot face the Earth anymore. Before they leave, we have an amazing character beat. Golbez asks Cecil if he's possibly forgiven him, and Cecil doesn't answer. He can't bring himself to say one way or another because Golbez has brought such destruction to the world. But he was also mind controlled, and maybe more importantly, Golbez is the one piece of family Cecil actually has. Before Fusoya and Golbez leave, Cecil does at least properly wish his brother goodbye. Back home, we get a postscript of all the characters back in their areas. The twins continue to train. Edge is a poor king because he's too busy being in puppy love with Rydia. Rydia returns to the land of summons. Yang and his amazing wife are the new king and queen of Fabul. Kane is unmasked on Mount Ordeals, showing his flowing blonde hair as he swears to return when he has bettered himself. And in the final scene, all of the major players approach the Kingdom of Baron, where Cecil and Rydia are to be coronated. They briefly chat before the event, with Cecil believing he can faintly hear his brother wish him so long. Slowly but surely, everyone enters the throne room, turns around, and seemingly wishes the player goodbye ending the journey of Final Fantasy IV as the credits begin to roll, clocking in at just shy of 18 hours for me. Holy fuck, dude. I don't know where to begin. Fantasy 4 is not just good. It's not just great even. It's uh, one second. Let me back away from the mic. Fucking magical. I went into this game knowing that it was good, that some people, Tim Rogers, loved this game deeply, and that to many it is seen as the first real Final Fantasy. I was not prepared for just how exactly pure that truth is. Final Fantasy 4 is not just the first real Final Fantasy, it is the first real Final Fantasy that the continuation of the genre sprouted from. It's also really fucking good still. This game maybe has some wear and tear at the furthest edges, but on the whole, Final Fantasy 4 still kicks the shit out of a lot of JRPGs that would come 10 years, 20 years, fucking 30 years after it. Let me break it down for a bit, because I think there are things that FF1 does that feel iconic to the genre moving forward, and then things it does that are so brave that few dare follow in its footsteps. The major evergreen contribution is obviously the emphasis on story, like kinda no duh. But why is that the case? JRPGs have always had stories, but they've never had stories like this. Older JRPGs are built first as mechanical expressions, and the narrative is the window dressing that helps sell that expressive experience. The plots of those games rarely rush you into places, get you to focus on the next story beat, and instead give you the leeway to approach at your own pace, with your own exploration mostly allowed. The key word there is mostly. Sure, you can go to some parts where you shouldn't be at, but you'll be walled off by monsters too powerful to fight or thing you need item for. The freedom to explore is there, but it's mostly illusory. Final Fantasy IV, on the other hand, puts you on a greased rail with significantly less exploration allowed, but it does so to a point because it offers something so engaging with its story that you want to know what's next. The opening 30 minutes of this game is a masterclass that few in the genre can touch. It sets up multiple characters, 
most of which have interesting angles or relationships, and then delivers a narrative pitch that sinks its hooks into you. It does so much in so little time and then capitalizes on it for the next several hours. I think the first eight hours of this game are paced in a way that fly by. You won't want to stop and smell the roses because something is always happening and that something is always interesting enough to keep you going. This is a matter of taste. For example, I know that Leon from RPG Haven is much cooler on Final Fantasy IV because this form of guided walkway JRPG isn't to his liking. And I can see and I can understand that point of view. It makes total sense that this may not land for everybody. However, one thing I want to push back on that both Leon and Pat from Socks Make People Sexy mention is that the game and its story feel too simple and aged. I cannot disagree more. Part of the reason I find the plot for FF4 so enthralling is that it constantly moves and rarely, if ever, tells you to put down the controller for 10 minutes or so and learn something. This sounds like an admittance of its simplicity, but I don't find it that way. With so much of the fat needing to be removed to fit the game on the NES cart, all you are left with is the prime cuts, the push of the narrative, and the showcases of characterization that matter the most and the game goes to great lengths to supplement many of these aspects within gameplay. Edward sucks, he's no great adventurer, and he's a shoddy excuse for a fighter. This comes through in how he plays because his contributions to the party are rarely meaningful. It's a basic example, but there are better ones. When you meet Tella, he is regarded as this powerful sage. He has access to great magics and even more magics that he's forgotten about. But the thing with Tella is that his MP pool of 90 never increases. Over the course of the game and the multiple times you have Tella in your party, he starts to feel weaker. Age is catching up to him and the mage that you once saw as someone powerful and mighty starts getting eclipsed by the younger, more adept members of your party. Of course Tella succumbs to his rage, he lost his daughter and knows his life is rounding the bend. His powers have decreased with age, and so it's easy for him to give in to his vengeance. He is already living one foot in the grave, so why not jump in? None of this is spelled out in text or verbalized to the player in an extended cutscene. It's all inferred through how the game plays. There are other examples, the aforementioned time that Rydia learns fire, or how Cecil's growing power as a paladin allows him to better protect those he cherishes. All parts of the machine are working towards one goal, and the end result is something that almost never misses. There's parts of the game I wish were better explored, like I would have liked to see more emphasis on Kane being Cecil's original brother figure, and how Cecil has to compartmentalize that once he realizes Golbez is an actual brother. But on the whole, FF4 is so thought out and allows everything to flow into one body of water you spend the game swimming in. In fact, after finishing the game I discussed the whole of Kane's character with my friend. He sees Kane's constant betrayal through brainwashing as a parallel of the biblical story of Cain and Abel. Cain holds a jealousy against Cecil because of his rank and because Cain has unanswered feelings for Rosa. Post-production Jay here. Uh, my version of Final Fantasy IV Pixel Remaster did not have anything about Cain having you know, unresolved feelings for Rosa. I think that comes from the FF4 DS version, because for that version they expanded the script. Now that doesn't mean that they added what was cut back in. In a Q&A on the Square Enix website, Takashi Dokita was asked about the script and how it was being changed, and he clarified that it wasn't that the script was cut down to fit the original game, it's that it was revised. So it's not like there was missing content. but. That said, the Pixel Remastered version seems to go off of the original story content, and I didn't catch anything in that about Kane having feelings for Rosa, but also that doesn't really matter because the crux of all those Kane characterizations still hangs on like his actual actions, uh, if that makes sense. So it's, I'm, I'm like plus negative on it, doesn't matter either, either way. So when Kane is mind controlled by Golbez, it is something he more or less lets happen because he already harbors a resentment. I read it differently. I see Kane as an interesting parallel to Cecil. When Cecil finds out Golbez is his brother, he wonders aloud why it was that Golbez was mind controlled by Zemis and not him. After all, it is their Lunarian blood that helped Zemis do the brainwashing. 
Golbez mentions that the reason he was chosen was the innate darkness in his heart. This frames nicely with Cecil and Cain. Cecil is so concerned about the darkness that inhabits him due to his training as a dark knight, and he eventually purges it through becoming a paladin. But what is the nature of that darkness? Because of the two brothers, Golbez was chosen due to the darkness in his heart, which implies that Cecil's heart lacks this darkness. On the other hand, Cain should lack such darkness because he purposely chose not to be a dark knight, instead taking a more noble pledge to be a dragoon to honor the father he barely knew. Yet, Cain gets mind controlled twice. I find Cecil someone who fights with darkness, but lacks it where it matters most, where Cain is a loyal and noble knight, but deep down he may possess the truer form of darkness. That's a fucking story. That is a variety of flavor in regards to characters, and to do away with it because it is simple is missing the ability to read deeper on something that, as we know from its development, originally had more depth attached. Now for the other side, the bravery of Final Fantasy IV. It is fucking insane how effective your rotating cast of party members is. This goes against almost everything JRPGs stand for nowadays. What do you mean you don't have a large party to pick from? That's many people's favorite part. Amassing a collection of interesting characters to then pick and choose how you approach the task before you is so ingrained to the genre that it feels sacrilegious to not have it. In fact, some ports of Final Fantasy IV allow you to have access to the whole party in the late game so you can tackle it as you please. But this decision, this limitation to the player, is one of the most important and brilliant things Final Fantasy IV does. Previous to this, JRPGs were still deeply influenced by Western RPGs. They were games that prioritized systems and customization. There's a very real argument that Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3 are more replayable games, because every time you boot up a new file, you can tackle the game in a new way. Choose new party classes, level up Maria or Guy a different way. Experiment with new job synergies. The macro of these systems allow for emergent gameplay because you are given enough freedom to find your own way into success. The problem, for me at least, is that those previous Final Fantasies have very uninteresting micro. The big swings you make are creative, but the individual battles are frequently seeing me use the auto battle button to speed things up. Rarely do encounters with rank and file baddies engage me. I'm simply slicing my way through ham and eggers of the bestiary until I get a boss battle that maybe, maybe lets me think. Final Fantasy IV flips all of this on its head. Perhaps the macro is significantly decreased because you can't really sway your party into one expression or another, but the micro level is now exploding with possibility. Conversely to the NES trilogy, I almost never use the auto battle function in Final Fantasy IV. Part of this is the ATB system. Staying engaged, thinking about your next move, and being rushed to make your choice keeps you in the here and now of battle. But there's also the variance the ATB system brings. Those trap doors I mentioned a while back were able to be killed in a single round, if Kane went first or second with a jump. But Kane doesn't always get to be one of the first people going, so in battles where that wasn't the case, I had to think and pivot and do something different to try and beat the trap door as fast as possible so I didn't take damage. The swinginess of the ATB system makes even encounters that you should have down to a science feel different between instances. You never pull your attention away from combat, never does this become a podcast game, if you will, but what dwarfs the ATB system in effectiveness is the way Final Fantasy IV handles your party composition. Because your party is constantly changing, and I mean you are rarely given an extended amount of time with a comfortable party selection, the game designs encounters knowing exactly what skills you have in front of you. This acts as the inverse of to what I mentioned in 3. In that video, I theorized that a more ho-hum encounter design might be in service of such a wide possibility space with jobs. In 4, encounters are so tightly designed because there is no wiggle room. The game knows, right now, that you have Cecil, Rydia, and Edward. The game knows that right now, you have Cecil, the twins, and Tella. The game knows that right now, you have Cecil, Rydia, Rosa, Edge, and Kane. It is always planning around what it knows you have and makes encounters interesting based on that. But more importantly, because who you have is so rapidly changing, 
the encounters are changing with you, and it makes for this endless wave of engagement where the battles never devolve into just popcorn baddies. Final Fantasy IV, almost to a fault, never lets up with its changes. We've talked about Tella's death and how his characterization really works for the game. Other characters are not given such grace. The reasons your party members keep going through a revolving door often feels like it's gameplay first and then given a quick but lackluster reason to be written out. This constitutes a lot of the plot deaths in the game. Yang supposedly dies and you feel nothing. Sid supposedly dies and you feel nothing, mainly because you know they can't really be dead and they'll probably come back at some point. Tella's death works because it's given the ramp up and gravity that everyone else's exit lacks. But what does work is that they exit after so little time. You get Fusoya for like a dungeon, maybe two. Edward is only playable in the opening hours. The twins are in your party for a staggeringly short amount of time. Who has the balls to do that? To give you these shiny new toys, but only for a weekend rental and then take them away for the rest of the game. As my party ebbed and flowed, I wondered if any of these people were going to come back. Sid's alive and mostly kicking. When will he be playable again? I know Yang isn't really dead. Does he re-enter the party? Are the twins seriously going to be gone from the game after so little time being available? It keeps you guessing and it keeps you wanting. You are moving through the game constantly wondering what Final Fantasy IV is going to do next, a slave to its pacing and playfulness. Sometimes it gives you everything. Sometimes it gives you just a taste, but every hour that passes has the game give you something. As much as these earlier Final Fantasies were built with potential replayability in mind, I'm never fucking playing these games again. I'm glad I played them, but they don't offer enough to me to want to sit down and try them again with a different approach. But Final Fantasy IV? I will very likely play again at some point. It's a beautifully paced game that never lets up, never wastes your time, is always interesting, and much like putting on a comfortable movie you've seen before, is an experience worth running through again. I can think of very few JRPGs I've said that about in my 30s, maybe even in my late 20s. I'm a grown-ass man with a wife and cats and a house, and I don't get to spend my weekends playing video games anymore. I spend that time on maintaining all the other important things in my life. So for something to be good enough, to make me think, yes, I could see myself spending my limited time replaying this, is about as glowing of a recommendation as I can make. When I finished Final Fantasy IV, I felt it. That feeling of melancholic emptiness that something amazing was over. I remember the first time I felt it. I was somewhere around the age of 13, and my uncle had gotten me the box set of Martian Successor and Tedesco for Christmas. It was the perfect time as I was already letting my life be ruled by whatever anime I could find and I blasted through every disc in that box. And when it was over, I didn't know what to do. It was done. There was no more. I don't really remember much of Nadesco, but I remember how it made me feel. I've kept that feeling close, knowing that when something ends and that bitter sweetness washes over me, I experienced something special. Final Fantasy IV is amazing. I want to play it again. I want to get my wife to play it. And if we have kids, I will want them to play it too. It feels like it is writing the laws that will govern so much of this series and the genre itself moving forward. Save points in dungeons and before bosses? That wasn't in earlier games, but now it's standard convention. It really and truly does feel like the first real Final Fantasy, but also the first real JRPG, and it is going to be the bar for me on how I judge everything else in these videos. I've beaten 7 and 10, I've previously played 6 and 8, and I've been in the room during 12. Right now, 4 not only clears all of those games, but it smokes the living daylights out of them. This is it. This is the top dog so far. And it's going to be up to the rest of the series to see if anything can even approach this game. Please play Final Fantasy IV. It is honestly that good. Level up, it's 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 up,
<laughs> While Final Fantasy spent its time on the NES living under the shadow of Dragon Quest's influence, Final Fantasy IV would be their chance at striking first. Dragon Quest IV, which honestly still feels like a game FF4 could have taken influence from, was an NES release, and this left the door open for the team at Square to be the first ones to take the big step. Technically, it wasn't the first RPG on the system. You could maybe hand wave away Draken and Ease 3 as not really being JRPGs, but Gladeen did beat it to the punch. But who the fuck knows about Gladeen? Who even knows how the fuck to pronounce that? By my count, Final Fantasy IV was the 25th game released on the Super Famicom, which makes it an incredibly early adopter, and sorry, Gladeen, if that is how you say your name, the first seminal JRPG in an era that would soon become famous for it. This goes doubly so for America's Super Nintendo, where Final Fantasy II US would indeed be the first of its genre to grace the 16-bit era. FF4 would get a sequel almost two decades later. Though not the first Final Fantasy game to get an official sequel, that would go to Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy IV The After Years would come out in 2009 as an episodic game for mobile phones, eventually getting ported for systems alongside a midquel in the form of Final Fantasy IV Interlude. We are not covering those today, as they will be getting their own episode when we hit that point in the chronology. Doing so now would betray the method, and with how important Final Fantasy IV is, I think it would be a disservice to not look at its sequels with the same amount of care. I think there is an argument that Final Fantasy IV forever changed the course of the JRPG genre. I'm savvy of the history, but not enough to make a definitive claim, so forgive me if this is a bit bold. Pre-FF4, JRPGs were primarily system experiences, following in the mold of the Western RPGs that influenced them. Interesting mechanics, combat, and customization were the hooks that kept you playing. Sure, there were stories, and some games, like Final Fantasy II, had more engaging narratives, but they all still lacked that touch of literal character. You don't really know shit about Furion because it doesn't matter. What matters is the ability to play around in the possibility space the game offers you. How do you choose your party? How do you level your skills? These systems still exist today, but they are no longer the main call for why someone would come to the genre. To quote Pat from Socks Makes People Sexy and his feature on FF4, I was talking to a friend who hadn't played any Final Fantasy titles predating 7, and was trying to explain why 4 would be worth his time to check out. It's so cool, I told him. You get these two little wizard kids who can team up and cast gigantic spells, and you gotta climb this mountain covered with zombies so you can class change, and there's this demon you got killed at the top, and then he comes at you from behind, and the first question he asked, yeah, but how's the story? JRPGs having these grandiose stories is a load-bearing expectation on the genre, and it has been for a fucking while. I'm having a hard time thinking of JRPGs that don't have one. The only example I can come up with off the dome is Resonance of Fates. That game has such unbelievably crunchy system mechanics in its battles, and that is definitely the focus. I think Final Fantasy IV was the first step towards this dominant angle in the genre. In his article on Final Fantasy IV, Tim Rogers says he has beaten Final Fantasy IV 29 times, and that article was written in 2003. He's probably over 40 runs by now, because it is so obvious that Final Fantasy IV touched him in a way that so few other games could. That's what I believe the inclusion of this story brings to the genre, the ability to touch you. People are touched by the death of Aerith in 7. People are touched by the romance of Squall and Riona in 8. People are touched by the story of 10. This is what so many fans of the genre come to these games for now, and I think it is not a stretch to say that Final Fantasy IV is the game that kickstarted this. Final Fantasy IV may have a more simple story than the JRPGs that come after it, but it executes on it so well that it doesn't matter. I think as the genre progresses, JRPG stories, and even Final Fantasy stories, begin to swing higher and higher with more philosophically heady and complex narratives, but they don't always make clean contact with the ball. In contrast, Final Fantasy IV swings lower for something more simple, but it absolutely fucking cracks it out of the park. Its age does not limit it from being effective or lesser than the stuff that would come out as the future continues. Now, after Final Fantasy IV would come one of the more infamous spin-offs in the series, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Square was still trying to wrap its head around how to get Final Fantasy to take hold in North America, and as we previously discussed, they sent FF2 US over here with a significant amount of changes to make the game simpler. Following this up was a game made by their Japanese office, but specifically for America. 
Mystic Quest is an even more purposely baby mode JRPG, right down to the idea of it being priced lower to attract more young kids to the game. It lacks a lot of what makes Final Fantasy Final Fantasy. RPG elements have been sanded down significantly, random battles are gone, there's more emphasis on traversal puzzles. The visual language of battle is also closer to Dragon Quest or Saga than the style of Final Fantasy. In fact, Pat from Socks Makes People Sexy points out that Mystic Quest enemy sprites bear a striking resemblance to the sprites from Final Fantasy Legends 3, all of which checks out when you see that it was primarily the Saga team that put Mystic Quest together. This will be the first real use of the Kinda Clause. The reason this series is called Playing Every Final Fantasy Kinda is to allow me to play fast and loose with which Final Fantasy games get a full video feature. Previously we've had Final Fantasy Adventure and Final Fantasy Legends, but it's retroactively well known that those games really belong to different series. Mystic Quest is the first real, non-mainline game that bears the Final Fantasy name, and frankly I do not care to play it again. I played it back in high school, got decently far but never beat it, and overall remember it as a fine but not particularly worthwhile experience. It's interesting in the ways that make it not Final Fantasy, but not particularly interesting in and of itself. It gets a mention here for completion's sake, but we will be moving on. While Final Fantasy IV was a big step for North American players, they would have to sit on their hands a little while longer. Much like FF2 and 3, the next Final Fantasy game would not be showing up stateside, making it another one of the early series whose impact feels lost among the non-Japanese. But impact it made, as by now Final Fantasy was so popular that Japanese authorities asked Square to not release it on a school day, much like its brother Dragon Quest, for fear of school children skipping class to wait in line. Next episode, we look at the game Hironobu Sakaguchi briefly considered his favorite in the series, as we explore the last Final Fantasy held back from America, Final Fantasy V.